Mr. Alley, would you introduce yourself? Travis Alley. Uh, I reside in Granbury, Texas. Uh, <clears throat> I guess the reason why we're here is I'll turn 81 this month. Anything further? Tell us about your, uh, where'd you go to law school? St. Mary's University right here in San, San Antonio. Graduated in uh, June 1st, 1950. Was admitted to the practice of law in May 5, 1950 before I graduated. And before you went to law school, tell us a little about, were you in World War II? Yes, I was in the Navy two years, 1944-1946. And I got out of the Navy, rough neck in the summer in the oil field, uh, went to college, and uh, I sold cars uh, here in, in San Antonio as a sideline and actually graduated in uh, 1950. And when you graduated, let's, what was your first legal job? <clears throat> I went to work for, a, <coughs> excuse me, I went to work for a, uh, a lawyer here in uh, San Antonio. His name was George Cannon. He's deceased many years ago. Did you do criminal work when you first started, or did you do a little bit of everything? A uh, little bit of everything, but uh, I don't recall any uh, anything other than just uh, traffic tickets, that sort of thing, in the way of, uh, of criminal work at that time. However, when I joined the Air Force, I was a prosecutor there and defense lawyer as a JAG. And how many years were you a JAG officer? Well, all told, I was 30 years, but uh, uh, I was only on active duty two years. The rest of it was reserved. And then after you left JAG service, uh, active military, what what did you do after that? I settled in Fort Worth. They were practiced there for 45 years. And what was your area of practice? Well, I'm a family law specialist from 1975 to current. And uh, I uh, did a little bit of everything, everything from collecting debts to uh, serving as a corporation court or uh, pro uh, prosecutor in, uh, in small courts. Uh, civil, criminal, you name it. When's your first Rusty Duncan conference? I believe I've, I've been a member here of, of uh, TCDLA since about 91. And do you, and is this the first, how many times have you been to Rusty Duncan? Oh, oh, this? I've been here several times, I don't know, five, six. What do you think of it? I love it. All over the state that I never see them except if uh, something like this. Love to meet with them and uh, go out, maybe quaff a, a brew with them or whatever. It, so the best part of being a solo practitioner, in your opinion, is getting together with other criminal lawyers, correct? Just being alive, in my case. <laughs> what would you share with a young, with a young lawyer coming up? What, what experience would has most influenced you in your career? Well, Roy Barrera Sr. influenced me quite a bit. Uh, this must have been uh, some years after we were in law school together, but uh, he would tell me that uh, every time uh, he tried, he, he lost a case, a criminal case, and the guy, no matter how bad the guy was, stood up to be sentenced, that part of him went to Huntsville with the guy. I would boil it down to tell the truth, be honest with the judge, do the very best you can, and never forget that the man that you're representing is a human being deserving the very best you can give him. Have you ever felt like there was something you, you could have added at the table when you were at the I've never tried a case yet that I was satisfied with my performance. I could always have done it better. Win, lose, or draw. What would you say that, <clears throat> in addition to your experience meeting with other lawyers, that influenced you most in your criminal career? 
Well, actually, I didn't practice much criminal law until my son went to St. Mary's, with Roy Jr., by the way. Uh, and uh, uh, at least he, was, he, was with, he, he worked with him. Uh, I don't know. Uh, the, the practice of family law and criminal law are so much alike. Same lawyers. Uh, there's an old saying that uh, in criminal law, uh, you find the very worst people on their very best behavior. In family law, sometimes you meet the same people, but they're the very finest people on their very worst behavior. So they're, they're pretty much alike. If you had one special experience that you'd share with a, a young lawyer adding to what you just said, what would it be? How would you prepare a, a young lawyer to encounter that fear that they have when they go in the courtroom the first time? There's no, there's no substitute for, for going in the line of fire, just like being in the service. And do you've been actually under fire, you're not, a, you're not a service man. You just got to do it and uh, keep on doing it and, uh, as, as you have to. Thank you. Mr. McFarland, would you um, share with us where you, how you started up in undergraduate school, where you began school? Undergraduate school was at a place called Southwestern University in Georgetown, Texas. It's a small Methodist school. I was able to uh, get an athletic scholarship and uh, played football in uh, 1942 when I was 18 years old. In fact, I become 18 while there. Football season was over with and I enlisted in the Marine Corps. And I was very fortunate enough to be assigned to Southwestern University for uh, well, it was 16 months, uh, and they would allow us to take any number of hours we wanted to, and uh, so I, we had four sem semesters a year, of course, and I mean four months semesters, and uh, I was able to get 88 hours of my college training program and uh, on my degree and, and uh, January 1st, 1943, uh, uh, we, um, January 1st of 44, excuse me, <coughs> uh, we played in the Sun Bowl. Uh, we, they had uh, the people who had enlisted in the Marine Corps from uh, TCU, SMU, Baylor, University of Texas, and, you know, several other schools were assigned to this unit at Georgetown. It's a naval unit with a Marine detachment. And uh, so, of course, uh, I was there for 16 months and then I went to Paris Island, South Carolina, and Camp Lejeune, North Carolina, and Quantico, Virginia, and finally got a commission as a second lieutenant. And uh, business picked up, and I was sent overseas. By this time, I'd become 20 years old, and uh, and uh, so. Was sent overseas originally. There was 800 of us that uh, uh, were second or first lieutenants, and we had just we were assembled and put aboard ship, and we were scheduled to go to Guam for. They had a what they call a replacement depot on the island of Guam, and but they had such heavy casualties up on Iwo Jima that uh, uh, they sent all 800 of us 
up there as replacements and uh, I was uh, second lieutenant and just right out of Quantico and, and uh, to say the least I, would, I will never be as fearful of my own well-being as I was when they told us that we were we weren't going to receive any further training. We were fixing to, you know, uh, get, as they say, get your feet wet. And, but at uh, any rate, I, I was very fortunate in the fact that the 13 or 14 days uh, we finished the operation and the the. the the lieutenants that had preceded me as a platoon leader, one of them was killed on the beach, and the second one was got a heavy wound, and I was the third platoon leader that, and in King Company Third Battalion, Twenty First Marine, and uh, so we came back to Guam and and went through a lot of training. Theoretically, we were going to be going to Japan, and then, of course, the war became over with in August, and, um, and of course, when the war was over with, uh, the, they would allow you to come home. And the priorities were if you had a family, if you had children, how long you'd been overseas, and how long you'd been in the Marine Corps. And, I didn't qualify for any of those, and so I was one of about 1,200 people that formed what they call a battalion landing team, and we got combat ready, but we were ordered down to accept the surrender of the Japanese on the island of Truk, T-R-U-K. And uh, we got down there, and uh, you can imagine how uh, apprehensive we were because we wanted to be sure that the Japanese got the word that, that the war was over with. And, uh, but I think the war officially ended in like August the 12th or 14th and we went down there on Labor Day in the first Monday in, in 45. And, Fortunately, when we got there, we, uh, we landed in landing craft, and, and uh, we looked out and on the airport. To about half the Japanese that were there uh, were out there in formation, and so all we had to do was accept their surrender, and then we stayed down there until we could get all of them shipped off back to Japan and on January 1st of 46 we came back to Guam and by that time I could come home but they offered me an opportunity to go to Japan so I went up there and spent eight months there and then went back to Southwestern and got my college degree and enrolled in University of Texas Law School in uh, January of 47. And uh, so I let some people in Lufkin talk me into running for state representative in the summer of 48. I dropped out and went home and was unsuccessful in getting elected. And uh, so I then went back to law school and I finished. In, in uh, January of uh, 50, and then had, he and I, as I say, we were reminisced here today, and this first time I've seen him since we took the marks <laughs> 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 in 1950, but uh, they, uh, um, and uh, I went on home and uh, back in Lufty in Texas, where I was born and went to high school. And uh, uh, and uh, there was another 
man by the name of James Morris, and uh, he had graduated from law school the same time I did. And uh, of course, this business of the bar exam and being a lawyer is is a big deal now, but it, it wasn't all that big a deal then. I mean, and uh, in fact. In those days, and up until probably ten years ago, uh, you could study under uh, a lawyer for three years, and if they would vouch for the fact that, then you could qualify and take the bar exam. In fact, the greatest lawyer I ever knew was a fellow named J.J. Collins, and he was a school teacher before he. Uh, became a lawyer, and uh, uh, if uh, uh, if he lived, he only lived uh, a couple of years after I got uh, back there. If he had lived, I think I'd have been a lot better lawyer than I was because I learned more in sitting around and listening to him. Uh, the year that I was there before I had to go back in the service, uh, then I, I, these are practical things that I uh, could use. And of course, I don't know how about the rest of the lawyers um, in law schools, but the University of Texas, uh, to say the least, uh, maybe was because I wasn't a brilliant student or something, but I didn't, uh, in my 57 years practice law in Lufkin, Texas, the only time I ever heard of the Rule and Shelley's case was at the University of Texas Law School, I mean, uh, and that's just one example of a lot of other things that uh, Maybe it's good for international law, but it, it's, it's not much preparation for uh, a country lawyer, which is what I've always been. And uh, about the time I, Jim Morris and I were stupid enough to rent us an office, and we rented for $30 a month, and uh, we formed partnership of McFarland and Morris, attorneys in law. And in fact, we'd already been home anticipating passing the bar exam. And we had the, the law office rigged up. And, and uh, of course, East Texas had a problem at that time of the relationship between blacks and whites. and, and uh, one of the things that uh, in those days also, there were only 27 lawyers in Lufkin, Texas. I was the 28th one. And uh, uh, only one of those is still alive, incidentally, other than me. And, uh, but uh, at any rate, the, the older lawyers would welcome the young lawyer into town. And, uh, and uh, up, there was a the law firm of Muscle White and Finney, a very prominent law firm. And they were up visiting my office, and, and we had a little waiting room about, oh, it was probably 10 to 12. And uh, we had six chairs, which my sister had given me. And, and uh, so Curtis Finney came in and said, where are you going to put your other waiting room? I said, we only got one. I mean, we only got six chairs. That's all my sister would give me. And he said, well, where are the niggers going to sit? I said, they're going to have to sit here if, if, if they want my services. Because he said, you'll be the first lawyer in Lufkin, in Texas with a single waiting room and uh, I said well so what I mean I just hope somebody comes up here and use my services and of course 
Mr. Collins had told me that at that time they were paying lawyers two hundred seventy-five dollars a month. I mean, if you went into a firm in Lufkin, Texas, and he said, "Go on over there and open me an office, and uh, I'll send you enough criminal business that you can survive." And of course. I had worked on construction jobs during the summer, and, and uh, the sheriff was a former construction superintendent that I'd worked for. So I went down there, and his name was Red Condit, big fella. And he said, Eddie, I can help you. He said, everybody I lock up and charge with a crime wants J.J. Collins, but he says, they can't afford, nine out of ten of them can't afford him. He said, if they find out they can't get Mr. Collin, then uh, I'll, I'll help you get some business. And uh, so, and so Mr. Collins uh, and I had a brother-in-law at that time uh, was a businessman there and run a service station and had some rent houses and everything. And, and between those two, uh, they sent us enough people up there to, uh, we developed a fairly decent deal. And I paid income tax on $7,800 the first year that I practiced law. And, and, uh, and then, of course, I came to Camp Pendleton uh, that summer keeping up my reserve status and for a couple of weeks and while I was out there this was in 1950 in July of 50 well, they started the damn Korean War and uh, so in fact I was out there and they said well, there ain't no use going home but this time I'd make captain and, uh, and he said they're desperate and of course, the Marine Corps uh, just has one classification of officer, and that's a you're a field officer. And in 1542, it means you're in the infantry. And uh, your secondary classification might be as a lawyer or as a pilot or something else. But you're you're an officer in the Marine Corps, you know. Uh, you're on the line, but uh, at any rate, uh, I went back to Quantico and I got out to, incidentally, uh, when I got home, uh, Jim Morris and my brother-in-law, my brother-in-law knew a bunch of people, the two men that had shot uh, a bouncer in a honky-tonk and they had got in a confrontation and they killed him and so my brother-in-law knew him and so he got Jim Morris and they bonded him out of jail in Groton, Texas, that's 35 miles from Lockheed. So on August the 12th of 1950, well, Jim Morris and I, were, I was lead counsel in uh, murder case in Trinity County and, uh, and the jury, I'm sure, they had a special prosecutor, Mr. Musselwhite, and they gave us a pretty bad time during the trial, to say the least. And in fact, somebody told us that the first thing you need to do is put a case off. And uh, so, we got Mr. Collins, and he said, Eddie, uh, you know, I don't ever have to do that. I, he, I just called the judge, and of course he could do that. But uh, at any rate, nobody called the judge, and so we would go over to Groton, and we had us a motion for continuance, and we got now the statements form book, and uh, and one of the things that I did in that 
trial that I've never done since and would never do again. But uh, I took the word of my client on what a witness was going to testify to, and the witness was not there. So we subpoenaed the witness and, and put his affidavit, his father's affidavit, that uh, they had talked to this witness. So Judge Max Rogers said, well, said, you're a young lawyer, Eddie, and so I think I better try to help you find that witness. So he calls the Texas Ranger in and says, can you help Eddie get that witness up here? And so they found that witness in a honky-tonk down in Porter, Texas, and, and they brought back up there and uh, put her in jail because she failed to honor a subpoena. And, of course, you can imagine how unhappy she was, <laughs> number one. Number two is when I did interview her there in that jail, well, I got an entirely different version of it. So I've never put a witness on the stand that I haven't personally talked to, and, and I know damn good and well what they're going to say. And uh, they, uh, But anyway, it was... Uh, they tried the co-principal first, and, uh, and in those days we didn't have the bifurcated trial. We, it was just a trial, and the jury decided the guts, feathers, and all, as, uh, as they say in the business. And so, lo and behold, they went out and, and they came back in. And, of course, they were upset at this witness, our, our key witness, and uh, of course, she was mad at me and the whole court system and everything else. And so, anyway, they gave him 15 years. Uh, and uh, so, Mr. Collins called Judge Mike Rogers, and so they transferred the the shooter, the principal. By this time, of course, the family had run out of money, and so Jim Morris said, I can't, I can't afford it for both of us. And one of us has got to stay here and try to earn some money. And so I ended up trying that thing by myself. And uh, of course, I grew up in Lufkin, and I, I mean, and I worked as a uh, my mother and dad had divorced when I was eight years old, so I, I just grew up on the streets of Lufkin, and uh, and I knew a lot of people, and of course a lot of people had helped me get through school and everything, and one of them was uh, Dr. Linwood Denman, and, and uh, he and Mr. Collins were close friends, I mean, and had been that way for years. And, so they sat me down and, and went over the jury list with me, and, and uh, I got credit for it, but actually they picked a jury for me. And uh, we got him off for five years, and they argued for about four hours to try to get it suspended, but uh, I was tickle pink with the five years, which in those days we didn't have the law of parties, and so it pulled down the, uh, uh, because the co-principal couldn't get more than the principal, and uh, so, uh, you know, I've been pretty lucky with those kind of things, and, but uh, it, it's quite an experience to hit the ground running coming out of law school because uh, you'd have thought you was in a foreign country in Trinity County, Texas, as distinguished from the University of Texas Law School because those professors, they never heard of a criminal subpoena and they never heard of, you know, uh, an indictment, I don't, you know, Stumberg was a professor of law and, he was a brilliant man, and uh, but uh, see, we didn't have the criminal code in those days. We didn't have 
Code of Criminal Procedure, and uh, so it's radically different. And uh, anyway, January, July 1st of 51, when I got called back in the Marine Corps, and they sent me to Quantico for junior staff and command school, 20 weeks. And then I was ordered to the West Coast supposed to go overseas. And in the meantime, uh, the government had become involved in a lawsuit involving the water rights to Camp Pendleton. And this was in 52. And some idiot in the Justice Department uh, had used, see, the Camp Pendleton as a former ranch. It was Rancho Santa Margarita. And then the Vail Ranch was about uh, 75, 80,000 acres upstream from the Santa Margarita River. So this Justice Department had used the word paramount rights to all the water in Southern California in the rivers and streams. And, and that was the same phrase that they use uh, in Texas on the tidelands. But of course, the difference was that we joined the state uh, with an annexation agreement. We retained the right to our domain. But anyway, this lawsuit was going on, and of course, the Marine Corps didn't know anything about. Uh, water rights or <laughs> any of that civil litigation. Congress cut the funds of the Justice Department to the point where no Justice Department lawyer could work on that case. So they organized an a, a Office of Groundwater Resources and uh, with my one and a half year practice of law, they put me in as legal counsel, and we had some geologists, and, you know, and uh, the government lawyer would take comp time, and the Marine Corps would fly him out to the West Coast, and of course, in our uniform, we couldn't go inside the rail. Uh, but. He would volunteer his time, and we prepared the exhibits and so forth. And uh, so my time got up in March of '53, and uh, and of course the only thing I've ever wanted to do uh, is practice law in Luck in Texas, and. Uh, uh, I've just sort of lived out my dream, and uh, and uh, the Marine Corps interfered with that deal, to say the least. So they asked me to stay on out there, and I told them until every man, woman, and child in the state of Texas does six years and 23 months service that I ain't going back and I haven't gone back, and I ain't never going back. And, but uh, I went on home and, and let some people talk me into running for county judge. And when I ran, it was a two-year office, and, and but they voted a constitutional amendment uh, in 54. So I was the first county judge to serve four years ran for the state senate and was defeated and I told them the people had enough of me and I had enough of the people and uh, I've never seriously considered running for an office since then. I'm glad we got people that are willing to serve but I ain't one of them. And uh, so since January 1st of 59 I've either, I've had a uh, one partnership since then, and 
it lasted for about four years because um, they uh, and the man is still in luck and, and he practicing individually and he and I are good friends but uh, it you know most people in the criminal cases get in trouble at night or on weekends so you know if you're not available, then you ain't going to get too much business other than through court appointments and that's, a, a, you know, not good news when the bank accounts come about. But uh, at any rate, uh, of course, the law and, and the whole situation has changed dramatically since then. In other words, of course, when I was county judge, we had 46,000 people in the whole county. Now we've got 90,000. But uh, uh, it's not unusual for that county to have 13, 1,400 cases, felony cases, equal or more. Uh, county court cases. We've got two county courts and law judge. And, uh, and of course, the county judge can handle uh, probate matters and that sort of thing. But we only had one county judge and, and we shared two, with two other counties the judge. And uh, it's uh, a different world. Uh, 85, 90 percent of the cases on the docket uh, uh, are drug or alcohol related. At, at least 85 percent, probably 90, really boil it down. The underlying things are, uh, and uh, it's, uh, and of course, the other thing that we defense counsel by and large we're no longer trial lawyers I've tried as high as 25 jury cases a year uh, maybe five now uh, and then a lot more volume and it's like I tell people all the time we lawyers are negotiators now we're, we're not trial lawyers uh, on, I'm talking about the volume of business uh, I facetiously tell people I long for the day when we had just a plain old murder case where somebody got mad because they caught a, uh, the victim in bed with their wife or some simple thing like that you know uh, but we get a character like right now in my office is uh, we got a guy that was stupid enough to carry all of his ingredients in the back of a uh, two cab pickup truck and he got arrested in Hope, Arkansas and his wife's all shook up and she wants me to get up there and get him out of jail and you know uh, and those are the kind of things that we deal with and of course uh, we got a Judge White appointed as one of our district judges and we've got two district judges now and as I say when I started practicing all we, we shared the judge with two other counties to show you the difference in volume of business and of course the legislature meets every year and they criminalize conduct that is, I mean, uh, they, there's very few JP court criminal cases anymore. Why not mine? It's mine. <laughs> You know?
Hello? To bring this damn thing along, I didn't, I ordinarily don't take it, but, uh, uh. You want to turn it back on? Oh, it's okay. That, um, that call was from the president of Atkinson Candy Company and his father and his family owned two candy companies, they owned one here in San Antonio and Judson Atkinson and the doctor and his wife have lived here in San Antonio for a long time and, and I do their civil work and, and uh, but um, but getting back to the criminal practice, um, I disposed of 212 court appointed cases, and of course, the, and uh, I tried three jury cases of that. I had 84 of those cases uh, out of Angelina County, and but I disposed of those 84, and then uh, in order to a total of 212 cases last year, felonies, and of course the rest of them were private clients, and uh, of course the the district attorney's office uh, now has, you know, four assistants, and uh, the district attorney handled the three counties when I was in there. And of course, used to a misdemeanor was not considered, you know, a major thing, but uh, now. <clears throat> and of course, uh, there, there's never any kind of criminal case in the JP court anymore. But used to, uh, in other words, when I started out, I tried criminal cases in JP court. I mean, you know, uh, a six person jury. And, uh, uh, but the real problem, and I don't see that anybody's trying to do anything about it. It's the criminalization of conduct. It's going to get to where you got to have a driver's license, go to the restroom. I mean, the damn legislature meets and they put some more restrictions. They know you got to have a driver's license to exist in today's world. So if you're convicted of DWI, regardless of what the county or the state does to you. The first offense, you got to pay a surcharge of $1,000 a year for three years. Second offense, DWI, incidentally, if you get a, uh, if you lose your driver's license on a uh, first offense DWI, you cannot get a commercial driver's license ever. Uh, I mean, any other state or any, you know, here. It's just gone. Then you got to pay fifteen hundred dollars a year for three years if it's a second offense. Two thousand dollars a year for the third offense. And of course, we're creating a, a, a criminal element by statute uh, because it's not going to stop people from driving. They can't get insurance. And if they get it, it's some Jake Lake company that's, you know, will gouge the daylights mm -hmm. out of them. So we got people out there with no insurance. And I'm not talking about just one or two. I talked to some people in Harris County, and Harris County had over 10,000 DWIs last year. You know, of course, they got four or five million people. And of course, in a little county like Angelina County, uh, we got, um, we imagine 200 DWIs. There's three or four a week 
uh, and uh, and some of them are repeaters. And uh, this old sign about you can't afford it is the truth. And uh, if uh, if they're lucky enough to be able to have enough money to pay the tab, you can get them an occupational driver's license, but they got to produce an SR-22 insurance policy, which costs about twice as much as my policy or yours. And uh, so, and of course, uh, I recently learned, and the county attorney in Angelina County learned that if we had, a, I had a client, 19 year old lady that uh, was paying for her schooling over at Stephen F. Austin, working in a convenience store. And we, they recently voted Angelina County wet for all premise. And uh, so she made a mistake. She sold a, a, a 19 year old boy who told her he was 21 and, you know, uh, and uh, so she got her driver's license suspended for six months for selling beer to a minor. And if somebody would tell me what the relationship between selling beer to a minor and driving a vehicle, you know, it's absurd. But they know that if you possibly can, you're going to pay that damn money. And uh, see, that money goes to the Department of Transportation. Uh, so the idiots up there in the legislature saying, well, we've got a million DWI in Texas. If, if, if they have to pay a thousand dollars a piece, you see what I'm saying? You know, that's a hundred million dollars a year for, on paper, and of course half of them can't pay it and never will pay it. And they now have got a deal that every county, and of course they probably have 25 or 30 of them here in San Antonio or Houston, has a collection agency. See, these fines like in the cities and counties See, they got a, a statewide collection agency. They turn all that thing over. So we've got, and we've got cameras on the damn red lights. And if you run a red light, that's seventy-five dollars automatically, you know. And uh, I saw in the paper the other day where Harris County, they were the first big city to install them, and uh, had eighty-three thousand. Of those tickets, and the police had reviewed them, and only seventy-six thousand had to pay seventy-five dollars. Well, you know, seventy-six. Uh, the little town of Dybal, which has about thirty-five hundred people, the the JP in Precinct Two in Lufkin is. Uh, also, the city judge down at Dybal, they collected over $400,000 last year on traffic tickets. They got a three-man police force, and hell, that pays for it. I mean, and, you know, it's absurd. And, of course, we criminal lawyers are supposed to be able to, uh, in other words, do something about these tickets, especially for our friends or our kin folks, and uh, and of course, I just tell them all the time. You know, there's two people you got to pay. One is the funeral home that you, you know, buries you. Well, they won't bury you until you pay them. The traffic tickets you. Just promise them anything you won't do and just pay a little alone and they won't go out here and arrest you because they, the city and county have made a deal in Angelina County and they've done it here in Bar County. Uh, 
if you get locked up for murder and you get a ten thousand dollar bond and you owe fifteen Schedule C or Class C misdemeanors, then you can't bond out until you make arrangements to pay those down traffic fines. I mean, uh, there's supposed to be a constitutional amendment that says you have a right to bail, uh, but uh, uh, that's just some of the pet gripes that I've accumulated. Uh, if you have one closing comment to share with young criminal lawyers, what would it be? Well, Mr. Collins told me, and, and it's a philosophy that I've always had, uh, we all, all the lawyers went to law school. We all were supposed to know a little something about the law. And I, I know of half a dozen lawyers in Lufkin, Texas, that I personally think knows a heck of a lot more law than I do. But there, there ain't no lawyer in Lufkin, Texas ever knows more about the facts of my cases than I do. And in other words, the only way that what little success I've had is I start out knowing that maybe the district attorney or some of those people, they have a better handle of the law than I do. But there's two things that they don't have that I have had and hope that I will always have. One is I will guarantee I will have outworked if I have a case, I've outworked the opposition. I've spent whatever time it took. And when I leave that courthouse or that courtroom, I know I've done the best that I know how to do. And then people are going to judge me by the results I get. And the, Mr. Collins told me that there's two things that a lawyer has to have. One is the dumbest SOB in America will know whether you care about his case. And if you can't care about it, don't take it. I don't care what it is, you know. I have a hard time defending a person that steals, you know, just If I, if I take their case, I'm going to get rid of any personal inhibitions I've got. And I won't care about that song gone as long as he is in my care. And, and they pick up on it and they know uh, I've defended a, a lot of smart people and I've defended a lot of dumb people. And I, sometimes the smart people do dumb things, and sometimes the dumb people will do a smart thing. But, uh, and of course, the, um, and I don't know what I, Mr. Collins, I asked him one time if, uh, when he realized that he was the best lawyer in East Texas, because during my lifetime he was. And uh, he said, oh, I don't know, Eddie. And then this is what I sort of sum up my career. He said the first 25 years, all these people in Lufkin that I come in contact with said, you know, if old J.J. behaves himself, he's going to be a great lawyer. And he said the last 25 years, they said if J.J. Collins had behaved himself, he'd have been a great lawyer. So that's the way I sort of sum up my career. The, the first 25 years, they said, uh, Eddie's lucky and he's going to be all right. And the last 25 years, they said, well, I don't know whether he's been lucky or what, but uh, he's, he's been all right. 
Thanks. Mm -hmm. All right. I had one more thing I wanted to say, too. I, uh, uh, I recently ordered my tombstone, and I put on it, here lies a country lawyer who tried to do the best he could. Mm. Well, mine's to the young lawyer. I always advise young lawyers as they go, as they get going the first three or four years after they learn the ropes, be nice to the lawyers that come after them because you're going to meet them again. They may be wearing a black robe, they'll be the district attorney or the governor of the state, but they will remember you if you cut them down to size when you had the chance to do so. They'll also remember you if you were kind and helpful, and they'll give you the the benefit of the doubt more times than not. That's all. <laughs>